How did everybody do with homework? It's good to see you back, Josh. We've been, Thanks, Kevin. Good to be back. We've been praying for your backsliddenness. <laughs> Ooh, man. I hope your knees don't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. We were just, I think, me and Adrian were talking. I can't remember if it was on the video or not, but we were talking about how when you miss church and people call you up, they're like, what do you think that, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I miss a lot of that in-group belonging needs. All this. <laughs> I used to be somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Not until I realized I was nobody. <laughs> That's hilarious. Totally uh, depraved, huh? Say again? Totally depraved, huh? Yeah. I told a Calvinist today that he was a, a Calvinist was talking about how like it's such a blessing to be chosen by God before the foundation of the world. I told him what he was experiencing with it was evanescent grace and that he was a reprobate. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't he be? How else would you know? I also put a, I put that question, you know, we talked about it in here before, like, can somebody give me a verse for God's omniscient foreknowledge? And I think we drew a blank in here. I posted it in a Calvinist forum and it drew a blank there. And then I posted a question today, which has them all upset with me. And the question was, how does an omniscient being cure his own boredom? Yeah. <laughs> got all kinds of interesting answers and th probably the best answer was if he was omniscient he would know how to cure his own poor <laughs> <clears throat> i think it would just be the most dull thing in the world to know everything that's just me though but then you could do anything but you would already know the experience ahead of time of what you were going to do because you already know everything. But participatory knowing is the best knowing. And so, so are you presuming <laughs> that omniscience excludes participatory omniscience? Well, if you know everything, that doesn't mean you're doing everything. See, that's a great, that's a great, uh, that's a great distinction there. Like, I think just the question of omniscience, if you pull the four kinds of knowing into it, that automatically reframes the question into it, like a totally different kind of question. Are we talking about omniscient participatory knowing? And yeah. Anyway, I found, I found all the verses on God's omniscience. And if this gets out in public, I don't know when I'm going to cut this off. But if this gets out in public, people are going to say, well, he's denying God's omniscience. But I found that all the proof texts for God's omniscience that I can find online from anybody who's, you know, talking about it anywhere are very easy to problematize. Very easy. Like there's only one verse that says he knoweth all things. And that comes exactly one chapter to the verse after John tells his audience that they know all things and nobody right. thinks they know all things. So where does this idea come from? All right, so we're in Hebrews chapter 2. And we're going to divide the chapter into paragraphs. And we're going to try to pick up the pace a tad, if we can. Um, as far as paragraphs are concerned, the first one we dealt with was Hebrews chapter 2 verses one through four. And then we came up with a central idea of the text for that. So the next one, and you guys tell me, you guys tell me if you think this is wrong, but the next paragraph that shows up in the standard, the way the Bible demarks the paragraphs is verses five through nine. Welcome, Adrian. Hey. I didn't say hi to Scott either. He was busy. <laughs> so the, um, as far as dividing paragraphs, would anybody get something different than Hebrews 2, 5 through 9? Or does that sound about like what everybody got as far as dividing that into paragraphs? I actually did 
5 to 8a, and then I split verse 8 uh, where it says 4 in that he put. I like uh, that. I'm thinking outside the box. Because it seems that there's a new, like there's a new idea starting there. Um, okay. So I did 8, 8b to 9. Okay, 8a and then 8b to 9. Um, yeah, I can see that. Can I give a summary of what I think is going on here? In, in Hebrews chapter two, he just got through making the big case. And this is, this is me making my case and it could be wrong, obviously. So take this with a grain of salt. In chapter one, he makes this big case that, hey, we need to listen to the son of God because God spoke in all these different ways at different times. But now he's speaking through his son and look how much better his son in it, Look how much better his son is than everything else in the cosmos. For example, angels he's better than angels. And here's 50 verses on why he's better than angels. And then he comes across this place where, well, he's made a little lower than angels. So that's kind of like a discount. It's like a falsification. What would falsify that Jesus is better than the angels? Well, if you came across a verse that said he was a little lower than the angels, that would falsify that. So he has to deal with this. He has to deal with this issue. And kind of what I got, if you, if you imagine a hierarchy of tears, like say there's god and then angels and then man something like that and imagine that jesus christ has to pierce through down to the bottom of it all and <laughs> yank all the layers back up to where he is reconciling everything to himself something like that that's kind of an idea that pops into my head and a visual that popped into my head i kind of did a little quick video search i wanted to find a movie it seems like there's a movie somewhere where somebody shoots something like a grappling hook through multiple layers of things and then pulls them all back to where he is. And I, I couldn't think of anything specifically like that. The closest I came was I think that in the 1990 Batman movie, I think Batman shoots a little hook behind someone's head and the guy's like, ha, oh, you missed. But then he pulls it out and hits him in the head with it. <laughs> it happens in the dark night in the dark night by Christopher Nolan. It happens yeah. when Batman is raiding the, uh, the tower. Mm-hmm. He shoots a grappling hook and ties all this stuff together and then pulls it and they all come, they all fall down the building and hang on the building. Okay. So that one might be good. I can't, I can't remember. I saw that movie, but it's been years. So I can't remember exactly the scene you're talking about. Yeah. It's that's... got cool music and everything. Oh, well, that's even better. <laughs> but that's kind of the idea that I have in my head is like, Jesus is superior to the angels. He's superior to man and he had to be subjected to below the angels and below man and the seed of Abraham. And then in doing that, he, then he's in the position to where when he hits the, co you know, the button that pulls the vacuum cleaner cord back in, he yanks all things back and reconciling it to himself. And I'm, and I'm pulling from like, I'm pulling from like Colossians chapter one, verse 20, where all things in heaven and earth are reconciled to him and ephesians 1 10 things like that um that's the vision that i have in my it's the vision that pops in my head while i read through hebrews chapter two and three and going into four <clears throat> does that make sense to anybody anybody else see anything any, like that resonate with anybody or am i i have a, a cit for the paragraphs from verses four to nine, I made a paragraph mark there. Okay. And I did it weeks ago. So I'm not, I'm kind of going out on a limb here. I'm not as like confident in my, what I wrote a couple weeks ago, but what I got from two weeks ago or weeks ago from paragraph verses four to nine is this is what I wrote was, God has seemed to make dynamic, complex hierarchies involving angels, himself, man, and the son of man. And Jesus is linked 
to this son of man by means of, quote, being made a little lower than the angels and is commonly crowned with glory and honor, somehow by means of facing mortality. That's a lot. It is. So Sorry. can you see what's on the screen? Yes. How am I doing so far copying what you said? Uh, should I copy paste it in the chat? If you want, or you can just, uh, if you slow down a little bit, I can, yeah, you can copy and paste it in the chat and I can pick it up out yeah. of the chat, I guess. It was just way too long. Sorry. Where is the chat? Okay, I see what you're saying here. I was just trying to capture this this relation that I was seeing in almost like a, a juxtaposition of how Jesus Jesus is revealed as the Son of Man, sort of, or he's linked to it in some way, and I'm trying to I'm trying to. Um, demonstrate that there that his glory and honor was achieved by some sort of con condescending or um like philippians 2 kind of stuff human yep. through humility yeah <clears throat> yep that makes sense uh oh yeah never mind i was about to comment but i'm going to type comment in the uh, in the chat in the chat section yeah I mean, go ahead go ahead joe well uh, what nick was saying about the the glory of god through jesus humbling himself and not only coming down from heaven to to be human take on the form of flesh but to actually die and, mm -hmm. and there's the glory i was thinking about the calvinistic idea of the glory of god and it seems calvinism thinks or or claims that god glorifies himself by exerting his power sovereignty meticulous and and throwing people into hell for no reason uh maybe i mean you know and 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 i think that when god made his moses asked to see god's glory it says god passed his glory his glory would pass before moses no it says his goodness would pass before moses you know and so maybe i'm getting a little bit off on a tangent here uh relating this to calvinism but but i think of first corinthians 13 you know where love which is greater than faith to move mountains love seeks not her own but according to calvinism God seeks his own, but God is love. And that seems like a glaring contradiction. That's a very interesting, um, that's a very interesting take. And it feels to me, if I can say that word, it feels like it's onto something. Like it resonates with me. Like it seems that, um, it almost seems like optimizing for glory is a post hoc rationalization to justify a systematic theology. Whereas if you were to read scripture on the surface, you would not come across with that optimization. Whereas you might come across with an optimization of love and glory as a byproduct, or hmm, I'm not saying it right. So the thing that also occurs to me is are we are we biased with optimizing for glory because of some kind of influence of systematic theology from something like Calvinism? Yeah, um, I agree with what Joe is saying. And I've heard Layton Flowers say something similar that Calvinists are, like you said, they're using glory as a post hoc rationalization to justify their systematic and God's glory is the goal, but not in the way that Calvinists think it is. Like in their head, he can choose some people for heaven and choose some people for hell, 
because he's God and he can do what he wants and everything is to glorify him. So we can say something that contradicts the scripture and that contradicts God's character if we just appeal to glory. And it's like God's glory is the goal, but not in the way that you think it is. And I think Layton Flowers, he's explained it really well. He said that Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. You know, he's not trying to glorify himself by, you know, sending people to hell from the before the foundation of the world. Yeah, I have, I have so many thoughts going through my head right now. Like uh, in Romans, it seems like the goal of Romans is the glorification of the sinner. Because in Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, which is which is a problem identity statement. Yeah, that's <clears> another thing. I don't think that Calvinists ignore, acknowledge the fact that God wants to glorify us too. So he's not all about his own glory. <laughs> and I think how you get glory is, is something to think about. It seems that Calvinism sees glory... Uh, uh, by virtue of power or control whereas actually in the bible i think of he that would be the greatest would be the servant of all and you ever have yeah. a moment where um i'm sorry go ahead joe but that's it but glory through love uh, versus glory through power you ever have a moment where you have like a moment of insight or realization where you're like uh that's how that works or that's what caused that it's like this amazing moment Eureka. of insight of revelation I, I get the sense from scripture that this that god's glory is a like an insightful revelatory manifestation of god that kind of is difficult to get people in the place where they can see it and in the end they suddenly they come to a place where they can see the thing but there's there's something about manifestation it's i, I don't i think it's less about monarchical diadem kind of glory and more about some kind of realization some kind of uh, moment of insight or enlightenment something like that or a small voice right it, yeah it could be associated with a small voice but when you when you have that moment when you finally see what's had it's, it's it's like when you what that moment where you no longer need the explanations because you can actually see the thing like imagine you're going to see something you're going to see the grand canyon and you've never seen it so you have to rely on explanations and of course, we've seen pictures and stuff today. But once you've seen it, you don't need the explanations anymore. You've you've beheld it in all of its glory. And and there's something I think there's something like that that we, I don't know. In in <laughs> in Second Corinthians um, chapter four, there's a I think there's a theme of light and dark and then glory at the end. And the, so there's that verse, verse six, for God who hath commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. That's the like light shining, I think is the sense I get from glory. And that would be that moment of insight that you're kind of getting out. So the light to sh getting at the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ when I think of glory, I think, and then later on, I think it says something about the eternal weight of glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 16, for which, uh, which cause we faint not, but through, uh, through our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is, but that would be the all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God yeah. for our light affliction, our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding internal weight of glory. Sorry. <clears throat> and what passage was that you were just reading? That's all second Corinthians four. So in my mind, when I think of sec, when I think of light, light, a contrast between light and dark and glory, I think of second Corinthians four. 
that's you know you gotta i don't want to blow your head up or anything but you you got a really good knack for calling in relevant passages <laughs> based on a topic of discussion uh, that's interesting here also in verse two it's contrasted with handling the word of god deceitfully and then um there's a manifestation and commending which is showing to every man's conscience in the sight of god and then a contrast with being hidden yeah see there's that word conscience again the light of conscience that i'm that i that i really like to like meditate and think about is that the yeah. light of conscience between the heart and the mind that whole thing but i don't want to get too off topic <laughs> let's look at um adrian's cit um as it was prophet let's look at the passage real quick for unto us unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come wherever we speak but in one certain place testified saying what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him of course that comes from psalm 8 Thou made him a little lower than the angels thou crownest him with glory and honor to set him over the work of thy hands thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet now and then he gives this explanation so um paul put the division right here for the paragraph division right there in the middle of eight because he's finished quoting out of psalm eight and now the author of hebrews is explaining what he just read or the reasoning here for in that he hath put in subjection under him he left nothing that is not put under him but now we see not yet all things put under him in other words the assigning of dominion of all things to the son of man is not something that is uh concretized what's that word nick concretion <laughs> condescended no the concretion Chronis, uh, oh Chronis, okay Chronis. Yeah, 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 yeah. no 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 yeah yeah no that's joe's word it's chronistic so to bring it into the concrete is what i'm looking for concretion it's a whitehead oh. term oh well is Joe's another acne. word no, I'm talking about like he Whitehead has this thing about prehension and concretion where um, their prehension is an idea that is in like potential that it has not man has not come into reality yet for all intents mm -hmm. and purposes. And then concretion is when it actually comes into reality. And so in that he hath put all all in subjection under him, he left nothing is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So it's like it's the idea that all things will be put under Christ is is a prehension right now and will be con concretized brought, brought into concretion later does that, does that make sense yeah that's that's registering i did not catch that at all or implemented yeah so it's almost like the uh, an easier illustration would be in like galatians yeah implemented would be good like in galatians when he says okay you're an heir because you're a son but you're not old enough yet so you're going to be put under tutors and governors and certain, you know, you're going to be like a servant until the time comes when you can rule over your estate, but that time isn't yet. So it's yours, but you can't do anything about it yet. Something like that to where you have a, a future aspect of the authority that is given to the son. And then he says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Um, so there is this go down to the lowest level and do some kind of rescue effort, if you will, in a sense. So that, I mean, that's me reading into it. But now that we've read the text this cit here of verses five through nine says as it was prophesied jesus was made lower than angels temporarily so he would have dominion ultimately now and it's funny because i had not read that yet but it seems like it captures exactly what i was trying to say a second ago um lower temporarily because the dominion is a prehension right now and is not concretized yet concretion or i, I never get that word right but ultimately it will, it will occur. Um, a word that I really like here is dominion, because if you start thinking about scripture from the very beginning, it's all about who's got dominion, who's got dominion. Adam gets dominion, then Noah gets dominion, 
ultimately Solomon gets dominion, then Jeconiah gets it ripped away from him when we have the times of the Gentiles starting. <clears throat> um, Abraham had dominion too. And then, so there's this su succession of people who get dominion. And so the theme of the Bible is who's got dominion. And the subject of the Bible is Jesus Christ. And the climax of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is the right person to have dominion. And that is how things will end. And it, I found it very insightful to use that lens through which to see scripture. So dominion is a theme throughout scripture. So it's interesting to see this here. Um, so does everybody agree with these thoughts so far? Jesus is temporarily lower than the angel, temporarily lower than the angel so that he can accomplish something. And that doesn't mean that he's not worthy of the glory and honor and all that, but he had to go down there temporarily to uh, basically accomplish a mission and then come back up. Can I interject really quick? Yep. This is just something that it just kind of hit me that I, I just want everybody to consider. And it might just be me. Can we, I feel like me personally, I've lost, I've lost the, we're going too fast. Okay. Like even myself, does anybody else, is anybody else sensing that? Can we bet, can we slow down and back up and it, the speed of, uh, of yeah, how yeah, we're going yeah. through? Does, I'm probably I don't know if anybody else is. No, it was me. It was me too, for sure. Um, I'm maybe it's just cause I'm, I, I was in the sun all day and it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do you, um, okay, we can go back slow a little bit. What is it that makes you feel like we're going too fast? That's a good question. Um, I want, can we, can, what, can we identify exactly more precisely what, our task, uh, the, the, the moment task is right now, what we're focused on. So what I want to do ultimately see this little CIT here. Yep. I want to get a CIT like this. Okay. For all the paragraphs. Okay. And then put you. them back to back in order for chapters one through six and okay. read them like a single paragraph and see if they make sense. So what we're trying to do is get a sense of like in, in our attempt to interpret, we're going to, we're going to do a reduction into a summary version, a central idea of each paragraph. And then we're going to do a comparison of the reductions to see if it maintains, see what kind of fidelity to the original, it seems like it maintains to us. And then if it does, or it doesn't, then we go back and check why or why not? Did we do something procedurally wrong? Or are we misunderstanding the text? Does that make sense? And then once we have central ideas of the text all in order, maybe we could cluster those into groups of three or four and come up with central ideas for them. Um, and so it comes up, it comes out to be a checksum exercise as you're moving forward. And it co also comes out to be a, when you do the reduction, it helps clarify where the author is trying to go with it. I, can I say something real quick? Yeah, yeah. So for me, I think I I can kind of feel a little bit of Nick's frustration. Um, and here's what I feel about it. It's just we're we're working with a blank a blank piece of paper, and I guess I felt I feel like if we had more of an outline, we could zoom out and zoom in a little bit more clearer, and we could separate our thoughts a little bit better. 
and but that's just me i don't want to get too procedural uh no, especially when that's it's, that's that makes sense so how would you how would we come across more of an outline you mean like a more comprehensive outline well i guess i'm i i would have a worksheet in my brain somewhere where like, it's like like a more a zoomed, zoomed out one well yeah something that's zoomed out and then when there's a topic or a sentence or a phrase that we want to zoom in on more where you're talking about dominion or you know or an idea trying to to formulate a good metaphor you know then we could zoom in on it and we would kind of still be able to follow in order where we're at in the passage in the scripture and keep going so yeah that's that makes a lot of sense how do we come up with the zoomed out outline i have a thought yeah it to in a sense um and maybe this is not the ultimate reality, but in a sense, it, it seems that we're sort of creating the outline in what we're doing here. Right. Uh, right. That's what we're trying so, to do. Right. So, we're, trying, we're trying to create that zoom out outline. I thought that's what we were doing when we came up with all these CITs and yes. then the outline would be the chronological CITs that we came up with. Right. But right. I, yeah, there can be different, the outline. we don't have one yet. There can be different levels of outlines, like, like you know, an iterative, like in uh, Kevin. I, I know you've talked about software development, and the, you know, you yep. you 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 design, uh, you test, and you go back yep, and yep. redesign, like the like, waterfall. Like you're using like an agile method. Yeah, instead of a waterfall time, method. Yep. Yeah, in, in each each cycle it should hopefully improve so yep. maybe it'll fill in some gaps each time you go through so so there can be different levels of outline like we're creating one level of an outline maybe in a loose definition of the term but but maybe what josh is referring to is um, a higher level less detailed outline to kind of channel the efforts for the more detailed yeah yeah and I, and I totally agree with that um well i think my point was just that we're kind of working off of a blank piece of paper we don't have a, a roman numeral one or one numeral numeral two or an a or a b or it's just all kind of thrown in there together so if you didn't know what we were already doing it'd be a lot harder to follow along and and kind of grab grab it all okay that makes sense i think i see what you're saying but back to what roberta said i think i see what both of you are saying that we kind of need an outline but like roberta said i feel like what we're doing right now is figuring that out in a way but maybe you're wanting to see us go through that process in a more structured format. Are we not going through the structured uh, process on our own in the homework, mm -hmm. in identifying the verbs and the subjects? Right, so idea, ideally what we could do, what, what I was hoping to do would come up and I would say, hey, where do we put the paragraph marker for five through nine in your homework? And in the homework, say people come up with five through nine, or then we got four through nine, or then we got, you know, five through eight and a half, and then eight and a half through nine, something like that. Come up with a CIT or a couple of CITs for that for that structure. And then they would come from us. Like if we have done them as homework, we could just list them all here. And then we could go to the next passage. Then we could pick the best CIT or construct one ourselves from the CITs and then put them all in line and have our own outline. Yeah, I think I see what Josh is saying about having Roman numerals, but I think that's something that we can't have until we go through the process of establishing where the paragraph. Yeah, it's one of those chicken and egg yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> and like Joe, Joe was saying, like iterative, you're gonna take one pass over it and then it's gonna start to take more shape as you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I were to take, well, I've got. Um, and maybe we haven't, I haven't, I, I confess, I didn't do all my, my homework. 
but I did watch your two hour video on premature optimization. <laughs> but <laughs> for, for the software <laughs> part, I, I did the wrong assignment. Yeah, but I did the wrong assignment. That's hilarious. So for one, one through four, we had something like that. And there was, there were several others, but I'm just grabbing one for the sake of time. And then for the second one, it wasn't as easy. So I'm skipping it for the, <laughs> for the next one. We had a few CITs and if I just pick one, just picking one for Hebrews two, one through four. So, so far, and then let me take Adrian since it's short. Right here. And this would be two, five through nine. And I know these are all crazy uh, fonts and everything. I'm going to try to bring some kind of order to it. So God, who formerly spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has spoken to us recently by his cosmically exceptional son. We must listen to God's passing salvation message witnessed by signs, or we will not escape just retribution. As it was prophesied, Jesus was made lower than the angels temporarily, so he would have dominion ultimately. That's kind of what we have so far as, as an outline. And we're, what we're doing is we're extracting these statements. It's like a sentence outline. We're extracting these statements from the paragraphs as we go. Oh, typo in angels. Where? Uh, two, five angles? through nine. I think she meant to say angles. Oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do that. I do that typo all the time myself. I have so many typos in my videos. I just found a, a typo in a video that was from like four years ago. I know. Sometimes my brain and fingers are not on speaking terms. So what we're trying to do for each one of these central ideas of the text, the criteria is that it needs to be anywhere from 13 to 18 words typically. And we're trying to capture, we're trying to summarize and capture the main ideas from where we have drawn the paragraph lines. So if we're doing five through nine, what is one sentence that's 13 to 18 words that captures the main issues here? And something else we point out, what we could also do is once you come up with your CIT of that paragraph, you could turn it, you could reword it as a question and then turn around and preach that. Like, what was... What were... What is the sequence of events that ultimately led to Jesus having dominion or ultimately will lead to Jesus have dominion? You could word this as a question like that. And then you could preach this passage as the answer to that question. So we're comparing these. So I'm looking at verses five through nine. Does, does everybody think, does anybody else have a CIT for five through nine that you did for homework? I did. I had everything is in subjection to the sun, subjugation to the sun, but not yet. Sanctified and sanctifier are one, but I've got sanctified and sanctifier are one crossed out, but it's been so long ago, I don't even know why I crossed it out. I, I don't see it in the passage, so I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, everything is under subjugation to the sun, but not yet. Everything, everything is in subjugation to the sun, but not yet sanctified and sanctifier are one and i don't know where i came up with that but i've got it crossed out but i don't remember why because this was year weeks ago so 
I wonder if you typed notes in after what somebody said. Uh, I no, it's in my handwriting. It was from the homework. So I don't know. It doesn't matter. I mean, you don't even have to put that in because we've already talked about yeah, it. Yeah, I remember a conversation and I, it might have just been a YouTube video that I saw where somebody was showing the different members of the Godhead how God is the one that sanctifies Jesus. And then Jesus says he sanctifies himself in John chapter 17. And I don't know where that took place. Anybody else have a CIT for two, yeah. five through nine? I put one in, and in just the chat. I think we lost Nick for a minute. He said he had to go. Oh. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, so verses five through eight. I like got that. one from Russ. And then, <laughs> sorry for opening up the can of worms. <laughs> That's funny. And then Joe's CIT here is Jesus became man lower than the angels to taste death for all men. Okay. I like that because that explains why he's lower than the angels, if that's truth. I mean, yeah, that makes so, sense. Yes. Yeah, so what this does not address, as far as I can see, is that he retains his glory in doing so. Because I think the, the argument would mm -hmm. be this. You're trying to tell the Jews, hey, Jesus is now the spokesman. You better listen to him because, look, he's better than the angels. And then a counter argument would be, but look, he was made a little lower than the angels. Haven't you read Psalm 8? And so then the counter counter argument would be, yes, he was, but there's a reason for that. <laughs> he had to be so that he could go taste death for every man. That kind of thing. Because he just made an argument that Jesus is better than the angels, but now we have a passage saying he's lower than the angels. So he's got to, he's got to resolve that dissonance. It's, a, it's an apparent contradiction. It's an apparent dissonance that looks like the author has to resolve to me. Um, so like if I were to modify CIT for five through nine, like Joe's CIT there, Jesus became man lower than the angel, angels while retaining glory, his glory, to taste death for everyone. Something like that. I don't know. That's a little sloppily worded. But as we're going through this exercise, does anybody feel like you're getting a, because of our repetition and hitting the concepts in the text, do we feel like it's kind of burning in what it's talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that. I think too, all, all the number of times we've read the passages, mm -hmm. uh, the flavor of what is being written or what is being taught is, is coming through. And then when it's summarized like this, it resonates. Yeah. I like that. I like, I like the word flavor. It's poetic and it captures something that a, prosaic description can't capture all right so that's five through nine now i think we're all tracking there he is higher than the angels but he had to become lower than the angels for a certain reason are we okay if we move to 10 through 13 sure well first of all i am I'm following the standard paragraph format that it's 10 through 13. If somebody has a paragraph that is not 10 through 13, you can say it. And if you have a, a CIT for 10 through 13, I'm all ears. I think yeah. I got another one from Paul for five through nine. Let me put that in here too. It's not Hello. that good though, because it it's with the idea of splitting up uh, those verses differently than what you guys had. So it's 
no so no it's it's not good or bad it's, it's great so <laughs> you captured something that i don't see elsewhere which is good although unseen by us where does that come from i'm not saying uh, it's not there right it where comes yeah it's um right there we see not yet all things put under him yeah yeah but we see jesus i, I was trying to contrast those two but i didn't have enough um enough words available yep so it's the same argument we have today if people say you know one of the things that frustrates me about church aren't you just thankful god's on the throne and god's in control well hello fool have you watched the news mm. <laughs> and that's it's like this meaningless statement that doesn't mean anything well, I know you're saying God's on the throne and God's in control, but look, he's, a, he's obviously not controlling this. So practically, that statement does not mean anything. It's, it's a, I, know, I, I don't know if it's intended to comfort people. I don't know what it's intended to say. But whatever, I know Jesus, every, all control is going to be attributed to him, but it ain't happening now. And to mm -hmm. say that God's on the throne now and that's supposed to be comforting, you know how many horrible things are happening right now? There's a whole lot of horrible things happening right now. It's not comforting at all. This reminds me of Michael Heiser's Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And yeah. he talks about how there are other gods. And uh -huh. you know, the Bible says Satan is the god of this world. And I think that we forget that just because God has supreme power and supreme authority, there is still power and authority that has been given over to Satan. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes people ignore that and don't factor that into how they're viewing things. And there's a passage that I'm thinking of. Let me move my chat over here so I can see it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Uh, of course, software never wants to go there. If I change what I'm sharing to a new share in first Corinthians eight, five, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven and earth, is there be gods, many and Lords, many, but to us, there is but one God, the father of whom are all things. Da, 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 da. And then, um, Jesus quotes a verse, are, are you not all gods? That kind of thing. And that sometimes the word Elohim represents a plurality of superior creatures but not necessarily almighty God considering the context. And you have to say things like that in a heresy fest like this. <laughs> I like that. So there's, so there's a seeing element to this. So we don't see everything yet put under his feet. Verses 10 through 13 says, for it became him who are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctified and those who are sanctified are all of one. That's probably where your statement came from, Roberta. Yeah, I should have done the keep reading principle. That's why I crossed it out <laughs> over there because when I got over here, I made that my CIT. Christ is the sanctifier and is one with the sanctified brethren. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise. So he makes a point here, and then he quotes a couple of passages to prove his point, to justify his point, saying, I will declare thy name unto the brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. And in the Old Testament, it says congregation there. And the word ecclesia just means assembly. And we... Yeah. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So somebody said that 10 through 13 was a struggle. And I would agree with that. Paul has a CIT that I'm pasting in there. Joe has a CIT that I'm pasting in here. 
uh, Paul CIT was he's made perfect in suffering, sanctifying, bringing with him many sons to trust and worship God. Jesus exalted, uh, Joe CIT, Jesus exalted, suffered, and says the saints are his brothers, indicating his love for them. Okay. What I would recommend for getting a CIT there is since these are just proof texts to justify the point made here, I would focus on what point is being made here. That makes sense? Yeah. Four makes this a reference back to what was just talked about in five through nine or eight through nine, however you want to divide it up. You know, four, because in other words, now, has anybody seen anything in here that's uh, could be challenging to some systematic theology in this passage? Oh, oh yeah. Um, it became him for whom are all things to suffer. And I think the Calvinists would say it became him to uh, do the opposite of suffer. That may not be what you're thinking of, but it's it's not. But it's interesting that you would say that yeah it says he's for whom are all things by whom are all things but it became him to suffer and i think that points to god's love yeah yeah so connected closely with that here's what stands out to me as dissonant C considering that jesus is considered god to make the captain of their salvation, and I think we're presuming that's Jesus, that's a presumption, to make the captain of salvation perfect through sufferings. Are you telling me that the captain of their salvation, who is Jesus, the Son of God, needed to be made perfect, needed sufferings to make him perfect? In what way was he not perfect before that? In, there's a, a scripture in Hebrews 2 that might relate to this. Verse, uh, chapter 5? Uh, well, I think it's later. Uh, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by yep. the things he suffered. Yep. Um, I think that's 5.8. Five, 5.8. Eight. Five, eight. So if I go to a new share here. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience to the things which he suffered. That's very strange. It's a very strange thing to say for somebody. I mean, how could, how could Jesus, yeah. if he's omniscient, learn anything? And the, you know, I, the next how verse could, is, How did he learn obedience? Why wasn't he already obedient if he's the son of God and sinless? I think that when he was 12 years old or so and he, his parents looked for him for a few days and couldn't find him. Yeah. He may have learned from that experience and it may have been some, something that he just didn't know as a child. And he learned through that experience without actually committing sins you know so i think the first thing would be that well first of all we don't know i mean we talked about the attributes of god earlier the idea of like omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence i think it's very obvious that if god has those attributes that jesus voluntarily uh subordinated himself to not availing himself of them yeah i have a, a scripture on that too kevin yeah uh that jesus humbled him who being the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god yeah but humbled himself 
uh, or emptied himself. And I think the Greek word there is kenosis or related to kenosis. And it means yeah, the emptying himself. Yeah. So he, he did not know uh, when he was coming back, but the father did. Exactly. So, so, so the son was not omniscient. And he really emptied himself when he died. But even before that, when he became human, it seems. Oh, how y'all like in this heresy fest? <laughs> you know, the Bible's a wild book. And when you start to try to make a systematic theology of it, in my opinion, you make a fool out of yourself because there's always something that goes against it. Kevin, doesn't the Bible uh, doesn't the Bible say that uh, or define perfect uh, as complete in a in a lot of times? Right. So perfect comes across in Scripture as mature, ready, and complete. It never in the Bible means sinless. So I'm thinking maybe this suffering was was part of what he had to accomplish yep though he were a son yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect and the implication is there that the sufferings made him perfect because Back in chapter two, it says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So we see this again here. The sufferings made him perfect, made him complete, ready, or mature. He and became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him, which would indicate that before he suffered these things, he was not the author of eternal salvation. And this suffering was on the cross, which paid for our salvation. Uh, where's the paying for coming from? Oh, I'm just adding that. I, I just, I, it, it seemed like that the suffering that, that he endured was for our salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would connect it to that. I have a problem with the word paid for. I have a problem with that phrasing. And and could there be other suffering besides the cross? I'm thinking of Isaiah 53. He's so despised. The word or, suffer in English is not just pain and agony. It is to endure something which could be uh, a pleasurable thing. You could actually, in especially in 1611, you could say, I went and suffered a pedicure. <laughs> you know, I mean, the way the way the word suffered is used is to endure something or to go through something does not necessarily, although it doesn't exclude, it does not necessarily indicate pain or horribleness. But what so what you could do if you're thinking of pain and stuff, obviously. The passion is the biggest example of that. But if you're talking about whatever Christ endured, I would think that that would be a reference to the entire, the entirety of his experience as a human, like going through the whole thing, birth, death, all the stuff, all the temptations, all that stuff will be included in what he suffered. Let me see what the Greek word is here for suffered. Pasho, include the forms, patho, pet, uh, to experience a sensation or impression, usually painful, to feel passion, suffer, vex. So usually, but not always painful. The Lemus, undergo. The Lemus says a state of great suffering and distress due to adversity. Who says that? In uh, Logos, uh, the Lemus. For what word? For the word. Of, well, the, the word is... Um, uh, uh, like sufferings, but it's in the uh, in the sense of it is a affliction. 
what passage? Oh, sorry, verse uh, uh, verse ten. Oh, chapter two. Yeah. Okay, so it might be a different Greek word, which is interesting. So in uh, here, it's it's the word that basically shows up as passion in chapter five. That's chapter five. So if I go oh, to no, it's my. I mean, we are in Hebrews two. So if, so if we go back to chapter two, verse ten, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of, of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So if we double click here. It is a different word, pathema. It's related. It's close. Yeah. It starts off the same. Presumed derivative of thirty-eight oh six. Something undergone, hardship, pain, emotion, influence, affection, affliction, motion, suffering. Um, and what did you have? What resource? What a lexicon are you getting yours out of? This is just Strong's, which is lightweight. Well, it's the it's the logos uh, tool, and it's the the lemus. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. The lemus. Yeah, L E M M A S. So it gives the sense of the uh, of the word and the uh, so uh, pathema is the uh, is the Greek word. I don't think I'm familiar with that tool, or how to get to it. Um, not, not that I need a little yeah, lesson it's the Bible while everybody sense. else is waiting. <laughs> Sorry. I need it's a lesson Bible. when nobody's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it'd be up in tools probably. Yeah. Yeah, so pathema. So to undergo. To undergo something. Um, so to make the captains of sufferings perfect through the things that he underwent is maybe another way to say it which could be the passion crucifixion time, or it could be the experience, all experience of being a human being. Yeah. I would, I would point out that the, not to inject like uh, philosophy, but the existential philosophers would say that the most fundamental reality is that life itself is suffering. That's the most basic axiom of reality or, or of experience. Yes especially the Eastern ones. Although not just those. I mean, it just makes me, it makes me think of Buddhism when you say that. And some people, when they draw a connection like that, it suddenly makes them scared. Like we're following Buddhism, but we're not, you know, some people converge on the same things. Um, back to the textications. For it became him who are all things and bring many sons into glory to make the captain of salvation perfect through suffering is of course the Calvinists are going to use that word many right there. And that's supposed to prove a limited atonement, but we're not talking about who Christ died for. We're talking about who goes to glory, totally different subset of people. Um, you might, I think I have a video where I call it limited glorification. So let's replace limited atonement with limited glorification. That's what's limited to has, who has faith. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So that's really your thought. And these two verses are bolstering that thought. Just support for the thought. So of the thought. It became him to make the captain of the salvation perfect through sufferings. Because there's some kind of, yeah, there's some kind of singularity between the sanctifier and the sanctified. And it makes me wonder if that is precipitated by what happened or if it's a necessary precondition for it to happen. In other words, did Jesus bringing many sons to glory did that result in the sanctifier and the sanctified being all of one or was it necessary for them to all be of one in order to make it happen which one's the chicken which one's the egg
Any other thoughts on verses two? Uh, do we have any other CITs down here? Um, yeah, it did seem difficult to summarize. Why did it become him to suffer? Well, that's a that's a good observation question for sure. Why did it become him to suffer? It sounds like an explanation. This is part of an explanation for why Jesus had to be made lower than the angels. And then Josh says, this is why we're not striving for a systematic theology. You can conduct exegesis with any buzzword for any systematic. That's absolutely right. So whatever you optimize for necessarily modifies the lens through which you see the text. Any other stabs at 10 through 13? Well, I have a thought, but it's maybe you guys could help because you mentioned an idea kind of seeming to form. You're getting a glimmer of it. Um, so it, this, but it seems, it, it, this may not be exactly worded the most elegant way but but it seems that there's a connection between the unity there um he's not ashamed to call them brethren and that he's like the lord and that he uh he purified them or was captain of their salvation made perfect through suffering so all of those are related uh i think but that's what that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that the the oneness of the sanctified and the sanctifier is connected to Jesus becoming one of them. And it's not obvious to me that it's resultant or a pre a necessary precondition. <clears throat> oh. What are you gonna no, say, Joe? No greater love is any man than that he lay down his life. So there you go. He's their Lord, but he cares for the people that he's Lord of. To so that, I agree with that sentiment, but it does reach outside this text. <laughs> okay. So if um, I was preaching that or teaching that, I would pull from other scriptures. Right. But I'm. <laughs> And so that would be true. That would be a true statement if I'm taking the Bible as a whole, which I'm not against doing. But if I'm trying to optimize for what this author is trying to optimize for, I don't know that he's trying to optimize that particular aspect of Christ laying down his life at this point. Hmm. Is that a weird thing to say? So I think you had the question, why did it become him to suffer? Well, so I double clicked on become. And I came up with this word, uh, prepo, the Greek word prepo. And it is a verb to tower up, to be conspicuous, to be suitable or proper, uh, to be fit or right, become comely. So it was, in other words, you could say over here in the text, it was proper for him from whom are all things by whom are all things and bringing many sons of the glory that the captain of the salvation to make the captain of salvation perfect through sufferings or to word it the other way. It was proper to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Who's? Oh, something just, I just saw something. The next verse four. Yep. Did you read that because, and could that be the answer to the question? Why was it, did it become him to make the captain of salvation perfect through sufferings? Because he that, that's plausible. Because it became him 
So there's something about Jesus having, I mean, the connection is there. There's something about Jesus having to become a man and be one of them, to call them brethren. There's something about that that's connected with his capacity to be able to save them and take them to glory. He's not going to be able to take them to glory unless he comes down to be one of them. Hmm. What if I put that as a CIT? Um, to word it negatively, if we can word things negatively, or to word it positively. Uh, I didn't hit the share button. Um, Jesus had to become one of the brethren and suffer as them in order to be able to bring them to glory. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. <laughs> well, you could get rid of to be able to and just say in order to bring them to glory, maybe. Um because maybe not. Uh, had to suffer as one of the brethren in order to be able to bring them to glory. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Oh no. Let's let the grammar police change that and fix it for us. Oh, Adrian says she has to go. Thanks for joining us. We're going to be done in 11 minutes. Bye, Adrian. I, I have a, a thought on shortening that. I, I might have, I, I, I might have been muted when I mentioned it before, but, uh, to be able to bring in order to be able well to be able to bring them to glory how about just saying to bring them to glory and like getting rid of the be able that would get it under 18 yeah it's under 18 now um oh okay. in, I, I think i changed in order to just to two two three four five six seven eight nine ten oh. eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen so yeah we could just say okay so to, born of the brethren to be able to bring them to glory that might be too few by now 11 12 13 14 yeah that's in the range something about being made perfect though there's something about i feel like ability Something about ability or capacity needs to be addressed. Ability or capacity, that's just my... If you said Jesus had to be made perfect and, and suffer... That's just adding four more words and you're only on 14. So that would still fit. Had to <clears throat> suffer and be made perfect. She just had to suffer as one Wouldn't of the that work? and be made perfect. Mm -hmm. to... Yeah. That's still 18, I think. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 15, 16, 16 17, 17, 18. 18. There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's, I mean, we've full enough with that. I feel like I'm at my 87% uh, RPE of capacity right now. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, Kevin, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the true capacity? What's the true capacity of what? Uh, mine's about 67%. Of what? Your RPG. Oh, no. <laughs> you talking about a role player game? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're talking about a rocket launcher. Me and Nick were talking about this idea called the rate of perceived exertion. Like how much have you exerted yourself during this actually usually used for physical exercise. And then we talked about whether or not that would be applicable to a uh, confidence margin or whether it would be applicable to rating your own level of exertion compared to your ability to do sense making while trying to work through a problem. Did that confuse anybody? Yeah. So my capacity would be 50%. <laughs> I'm like, I'm tired. Like whatever my capacity is right now, it is thin. It is, it, it, I'm at my limit right now, of mm -hmm. especially the ability to do something while under pressure of being on a video and in front of other people. <clears throat> It'd be a little easier to do it and just have my wife make fun of me in private. Which she never does. She always waits until we're in public. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, so we got about seven minutes left. Do you think we need to delve into this at all or save it for next time for verses 14 through 18? Save it. Save it? So I would, I would save it, yeah. Yeah, as we come back, if people, if everyone does the homework and does this on their own, we could, what my vision for this is that everyone's doing basically two things. You're drawing paragraph dividers and you're writing a CIT of the paragraphs. And then what we could do is read the verse discuss where the paragraph divider should go and then compare CITs and then maybe come up with a supreme CIT or like see what some of the CITs are missing where we can help each other out with them and then go a little faster through. And, and, and I mean, Nick had a really good point. You don't want to go too fast in one sense, but if we make it through the text, then we'll have for our first pass what Josh was talking about like an overarching scaffolding to work with as we look at the text for a basis of comparison so that we can check our meaning against our previous sense making and against the text itself. And so we kind of have a sense of direction for where we think the thing is headed and then we can correct that as we go. So there is, there are two aspects to it. There's a slow down depth aspect. And then, the, so there's a zoom in zoom out aspect to this. And I feel like, Josh's and Nick's comments were both kind of looking at both of those and the benefit of having both of those. And it, if we do our homework, it is a little easier to have both of those, if that makes sense. And then we can work our way through it a little, a little faster pace as a group. If we put the work in behind the scenes as a, not a group, I feel like, I feel like a teacher scolding people for not doing their homework, but that's not my intent. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, does, does everybody have a clear idea of kind of what we're trying to do? Um, and then why we're trying to, one of the things we've got in Hebrews six, we have this really controversial passage. And I kind of saw this going a little faster, not that going slower is bad because that that's helpful too. It, I mean, it, you're in the wisdom gym when you're trying to figure these things out and when you're thinking about them. That's, that's really what the goal is, is to transform us into wiser people. But the idea is that if we line up all these central ideas of the text, by the time we get to chapter six, the, the text we started initially wanting to look at, will that better prepare us to deal with that passage when we get there? Uh, and then how much more would that work for anywhere else that we do? That's kind of the goal. So you, you kind of create a little bit of tension between all the meanings that you have reduced from a lot of the passages. 
and you can pluck that and tweak it and adjust it and calibrate it as you go. And you kind of have this working model or scaffolding, if you will, of the book of Hebrews, so that you can test whether or not a particular interpretation of a particular passage in Hebrews matches the skeleton, or whether it looks like a, a tumor that doesn't belong. Make sense? So that's what we're trying to do. So find the paragraphs, write up, determine your own CIT for chapters three, four, and five, and six, <laughs> and bring them all back next week. And we're going to put them in an outline for Josh. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Josh. I'm just messing with you. Hey, real quick, I just had a, a little insight. When you, you gave that example of a grappling hook earlier, piercing yeah. through multiple layers, when you guys started talking about all things under subjection and then, um, I, for, I forget what's her name now. She was talking about Adrian. You know, Adrian, I'm so sorry. I thought of that same analogy only in regards to our relationship with God, our communication with him. And there's always, it's like, we have to go through multiple layers in our experience, in our participatory, participatory, um, you know, lives. And, and it, for me, that just kind of like stuck out to me at, at how, how deep our communion with God is for it to be able to go through so many layers, so many different dominions, if you want to call it that. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that in there. No, it's, I, I just want to sit and think about that for a second, because it sounds right. It sounds also something, it sounds profound that there there are i mean jesus had to subordinate himself and humble himself to become like one of us so as as we communicate with god and try to transform be conformed into the image of god's son how many how many layers are we having to see through you, you remember those old uh i think they were popular in the 90s Remember those posters that just look like a Jackson Pollock painting or something? But if you look at it kind of cross-eyed, you could see a 3D image in it. Magic eye. Mm -hmm. you remember those? It's something like that. But imagine like, like you have to look through the thing in order to see the real thing. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine if there was another layer behind that that you had to look at a different way and another layer behind that that you had to look at a different way. And so what what Josh is saying kind of makes me think of that. Like God is trying to reveal himself. And I hate to say trying when you're talking about God as if he's limited in some way, which is not what I'm trying to say, but trying to reveal himself in a particular way to creatures who cannot readily perceive him, who can perceive him, but cannot readily immediately perceive him. And there's a, the process to get to the point where you can see. So I guess I would just highlight um, the depth of God's love, that that his love for us is so great or deep that he goes to that length and we can still receive and communicate with him through so many multiple layers or dominions or sufferings. I guess that's that's kind of it. Yeah, I really like that. And especially like when you say God's love, it makes me think of the word agape. And agape has that built in feeling of kind of, it's not just an affection for something like we use the word love in English, it's more like knowing that some other entity needs to transform and you're willing to help pull them along that path, even if it costs you something. And in the case of Christ, even if it cost him his life. That kind of love. Yeah, I like that. Isn't that kind of reciprocal transformation? I mean, because you're doing that with each other. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah. So there's so, <laughs> there's so many things. When you're interacting with another person, 
there is an element to which the other person is an arena to you and you are an arena to them. And there is a reciprocal opening between you and your arena, which happens to involve other people who are also happen to transform. So when you're with, when the arena is other people, it's a dynamic arena and you can modify both yourself and the arena at the same time. And you like a marriage is like that where the reciprocal opening is transformative for both partners and they both walk away transformed and better ideally because of the interaction with each other and in love they both tug at each other to improve and reciprocally open up to each other and then all and then like here too it's a I, I feel that happening where we are all kind of tugging and pulling at each other and i feel like this group has shifted from where it started big time and there's there's you i don't know if you guys realize but you guys are so different from when we started and i feel like i am too we're just in a different place and i feel like there has been a, like a reciprocal a reciprocal transformation because of how we've interacted with each other which is pretty amazing yeah Rob roberta did you just come up with that reciprocal transformation because that's like so brilliant i want to write that down too oh. <laughs> it's the first thing i, I thought I heard, of when yeah. she said that can you write that down please i'm right uh, i'm gonna write it on this sheet of paper up here reciprocal transformation i have a, while you're running that something might relate to that real quick yeah um it's in hebrews 4:15, uh and it relates to a comment i see corinne made uh he had to be perfect captain does that mean suffering made him perfect uh but it says we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin um so he, he was tempted like us and he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and maybe that's related to the perfection and also to the reciprocal transformation he walks where we walk he knows what so he have. transformed into something so that he can be an agent in our transformation yeah <laughs> and yeah he had to be per he, he had to be the perfect captain i'm reading corinne's comment here so does that mean the suffering made him just that what i'm, I'm not Corinne, oh, I don't yeah. know if you want to comment on that. Like just perfect or just the captain or the perfect captain made him just that. Yeah. The per um the perfect captain in suffering. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I wanna uh, somebody said we could export all this stuff, right? I think I might start exporting these chats and saving them. Yeah, the three dots down there you can yeah, see i remember somebody pointing that out yeah oh yes indeed save chat chat saved all right does anybody else have any comments hey Sufferings real quick also god decided to use the suffering to perfect us yet he had to be the first in accomplishing it it's captain yeah and cap hap, cap chap chapter top mm -hmm. of first one yes hey real quick uh, when we first started you mentioned omniscience and looking at the uh scriptures given to support omniscience yeah and finding they did not really do that they, well they could be problematized is... yeah well yeah. yeah so i i just want to paste into the chat an article that deals with that uh i don't want to take time to talk about it but there it is. That's uh, responding to an article by the chairman of the Commission on Doctrinal Purity for the Assemblies of God denomination, who was okay. also president of a Bible college. But it 
it's basically saying what you were saying. Some of those, there are problems with a lot of the scriptures. That's all. All right. Any other comments? All right. Thank you, everybody. I've enjoyed this and uh, we'll uh, do our homework and come back next week. I'm looking forward to it. Peace out. Peace out. Mm-hmm. <laughs>